Hey, good morning, gang. Hey, it's great to be with you this morning on this bright and crisp Monday morning. Hope you're doing well. Looking forward to our time together this morning as we continue our jet tour. And this morning, travel through the little three-chapter letter book of 2 Thessalonians. And so, looking forward to our time together this morning. Well, let's, let's launch right on into this study. I want to be respectful of your time. And if you want to, send a quick note to somebody you might, who might want to watch this with us. But let's pray together, shall we? Fathers, we come to you right now to thank you for the morning and for the time we have to be together. I pray you bless these few moments of looking into your word and taking and continuing on with this jet tour through the New Testament books of the Bible. So open this word to us, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, as you recall, last Thursday we traveled through the five chapters of 1 Thessalonians, and providentially we actually launched into a verse-by-verse -verse study of 1 Thessalonians on Sunday. But on Thursday, we traveled through all five chapters, and we said that when Paul finished that letter, he would have sent it to the people of Thessalonica. Now we found that in Acts 18 and verse 7, we find where Paul was at that time. Notice what we have here. It says, He departed from there where he was previously and entered the house of a certain man named Justus, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. So that's where he set up an operation and set up a base of operation, you might say, and it was probably from that house in about AD 51 that he wrote this letter to the people of Thessalonica. Now, he would have sent then, sent that message, sent that letter to the people by way of a messenger. Now, that messenger could have been Timothy or Silas, but probably not since he didn't mention them by name. It was probably an unknown, very trusted messenger or messengers. And they would have taken that message to the Thessalonican people. He would have read it to them, or they would have read it to each other, read it to themselves there in the church. With And Paul would have given that messenger instructions. I want you to respond. I want you to let me know how they respond to this letter. And also notice some of the things that are going on around the community. Now, this is the only way this could have happened because there was no other way for Paul to have the kind of information that he had when he wrote this second Thessalonian letter. I mean, they didn't have FedEx. They didn't have email or text or U.S. Postal Service. So it had to be my personal messenger that the letter was taken there, and then a report came back to Paul. Then This messenger then would have reported to Paul what the response was and what the culture is like and the conditions were like there in Thessalonica, that then prompted the writing of this second letter. Now, read along here a little bit further in Acts chapter 18. Look at verse 8. It says, Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his household. That would have been huge. That would have been dynamic. The leader of the synagogue, the leading Jewish person giving his life to Christ, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you or hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So Paul would have had plenty of time to have finished the first Thessalonian letter, sent it, on to them, received a report back, now have written this second Thessalonian letter, and now we have it. So now turn to Second Thessalonians, and we have basically an introduction, a conclusion, and three points this morning, but several things to share as we walk through this. Now, as you look at Second Thessalonians chapter one, we have a typical Pauline kind of greeting at the beginning. Paul Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Sounds almost ditto to the first letter. 
grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we have this typical greeting by the Apostle Paul. Well, then he gives them, first of all, words of comfort. Notice there in your study guide, if you have it with you, and if you don't, jot these words down. Point number one, comfort in the presence of persecution. Now, there are several things that Paul mentions here in this first chapter to commend them, to affirm them, to just assure them in the work. Look at verse 3. He talks about their growing faith. Talked about their mutual love for each other. In verse 4, their endurance through difficult times. In verse 7, he talks about the return of Christ. Notice, and to give you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So he talks about the return of Christ. A very important verse, sad but very important verse in the book of 2 Thessalonians is chapter 1 and verse 9. And what we have is probably one of the most descriptive definitions of hell and what eternal punishment will be like. Notice what we have here, verse 9. Talks about unbelievers, those who will not give their lives to Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And so it's everlasting, it's ongoing punishment, sad, sad to even think about. But also for those who think that hell is just going to be a, a party, just a kicking up good time with all the rabble rousers in the world, there's nothing like that, that hell is going to be nothing like that at all. No love of God, no presence of God, no protection of God. Notice again he says there, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So uh, a very descriptive definition of hell we find here in this second Thessalonian letter. And then we have in verses 11 and 12, a challenge from Paul to press on. So several things he mentions here in this first chapter. Then in chapter two, we have words of caution. So caution about the day of the Lord. And so if you don't have the study guide there, that's the point for this one. Caution about the day of the Lord. Now what we find here in the first two verses of chapter 2 is Paul addresses a incorrect thinking, a heresy, you might say, that's developed within the community, within the church, that was gaining traction. Notice what we have here, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Now, some of these folks are beginning to believe they had missed the return of Christ. And so Paul wants to clarify for them and to them, you've not missed it. And if, if somebody sends you a letter and, it's, and it's, it's got my name on it, I want to tell you, I didn't send it. And evidently there were those who were being devious and trying to upset the church saying, we got a letter from Paul and this is what he said. We've, we've missed the day of Christ. We've missed his return. And Paul said, I want you to understand, that's not what ha has happened. I don't want you to be soon shaken. I want you to fr be frustrated about this. That is not what has happened. And so he, he talks about that. If you look at the bottom of your study guide, I give you some notation there about the way to think about the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. And different translations will translate that second verse, day of Christ, day of the Lord. And you see here, why the interchange there and the difference of those two. So take notice of that. We'll not take the time to reread that here. He also talks about a restraining force that is allowing or at least causing, keeping might be a better word, keeping evil from becoming even more evil in the present day. And that force is still with us today. Look at verses six and seven. And now, chapter two, and now you know what is restraining 
that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. What I believe he's talking about here, I think this is general, generally accepted by theologians, the restraining power here, the restraining force here is none other than the Holy Spirit, and it's the Holy Spirit in us. And as we live the Christian life, there is an element of restraining power that the Holy Spirit does through us. Now, when we're out of here, when the rapture happens, then obviously things are going to change rapidly. And we know about that from the seven years of the tribulation period. So we see here about the restraining force here. He talks about the second coming of Christ in verse 8. He also talks about in this second chapter, very specifically, why it is that some people will perish forever. I want you to see this. Look at verses 10 and 11. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10, describing why it is that some people will perish forever. Notice, in fact, to kind of get in the reading here, let's, let's start at verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Notice this, because... They did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. In other words, they had an opportunity to be saved, but they would not receive the message. They would not appropriate the message that Jesus Christ on the cross, paying our sin debt, is the way to have our sins forgiven. It is a picture of the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that will not perish but have everlasting life. And because they would not receive the message, they would not receive that truth, they will not be saved, and they will perish forever. He says that again in different wording in verse 12. So let's read on verse 11. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned, notice, who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. It is sad to think about people who will perish forever in hell, but here we have a description of hell in this letter, and we also have a description of the reason why people will perish forever. They simply won't receive the message. They won't accept the message. Maybe they believed another way. Some people believe you just die and that's it. They take you out here and throw you in the ground and that's it. It's over. Well, that's not the way it works. And they're going to perish forever. It's a sad, sad thing here, but it's, it's here. Well, then we come to point three and command for practical Christian living. So point one, comfort in the presence of persecution. Number two, caution about the day of the Lord. And then number three, command for practical Christian living. Now, Paul begins this third chapter with a prayer request. That's very biblical and it's very Christ-like to have a prayer request here. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and, un, and wicked men, for not all have faith. So he asked them, he has a prayer request for them. But then he has a very interesting dialogue here, and obviously this would be some information that the messenger would have brought back to the Apostle Paul. Now here's what happened. Here's the background of this. The people in Thessalonica, some of them, a small group probably, had really caught on to this, really attached themselves to the idea and the truth of the coming of Christ, the return of Christ. And they truly expected Jesus to come back within days, weeks at the most. And they were just convinced this is going to happen. It's going to happen within the next few days. And basically what they did, they checked out on society they moved out to a mountainside or a mountaintop experience. The idea was, we want, to be, we want to be at the top of the mountain. We want to be as close as we can to heaven so that when Jesus Christ comes back, we'll be some of the first ones to see him. The way I refer to this is Paul actually is having a word here 
uh, to the spiritual elite in the church. And, and there were these folks in the church, they were, they were so spiritual, so they thought, that, hey, we don't need to do this, this work stuff anymore. We don't need to do this, this down here on the earth kind of stuff anymore. We're going to move up on the mountainside. We're going to go up here on the mountaintop. And when Jesus comes back, we'll be some of the first to see him. And so they kind of viewed themselves as the spiritually elite. Well, they went up there, and they stayed, and they stayed, and they waited, and they waited, and he didn't come. And as the body does work out, they began getting hungry. They sent word back down to the valley, hey, we need some food up here. Uh, we're up here uh, spending time with the Lord. We're up here uh, studying about the return of Christ, and we, and, but, but we're getting hungry, and, we, and we'd like to have some food. Could, could you send us up some food? Well, you can imagine what that, how that <laughs> would have been received by the folks down there on the ground. And uh, down there in the lower valley. So notice what he says here. Paul basically is saying to the Thessalonians, hey, when we were there, we worked, and they could work. When Paul was there, he worked with Aquila and Priscilla as tent makers. Paul was a tent maker. They were tent makers. Fellow tent makers, they worked together. Notice what we have here, verse 3. But the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we command you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Basically, what Paul's saying to them, don't send food up there to them. If they won't work, don't let them eat. If they get hungry enough, they will come down and they will get some food. And so think about it. Here we have a group of people who were so focused on the return of Christ, so caught up in this, that they had checked out on society and stopped doing the things they should be doing. Basically, they took their eye off the ball, we might say. Now, it is great to study about end times stuff. It's great to study about the return of Christ. I've done it off and on through all of my years of ministry. I've studied it a lot. I've preached through the book of Revelation, I think, three times, at least three times, verse by verse, and in other times in kind of jet tour kinds of things. I've preached through the book of Daniel a couple of times. I've studied the Olivet Discourse. I've studied about, I know about the rapture. I've studied about the second coming of Christ. But I'm going to tell you again, that's not the focus. That's not the most important thing. What's the most important thing? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you, and Lord, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Keeping our eye on the ball is Acts 1.8. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. Our call, gang, is to do whatever we can do to lead men and women, young people, children to faith in Christ. Now, I'd be the first to admit and I know we've got at least one fellow pastor here on, on the line this morning. We can't make anybody get saved. We, we could beg and plead, but we can't make them pray the prayer. We can't make them trust Christ. We can't save them ourselves. We can't walk an aisle for them. We can't be baptized for them. They must make the decision. But that is our call, to take the message to them that they would be saved that they would give their lives to Christ. 
our job, keeping the eye on the ball, so to speak, our job is to lead people to Christ. And it's great to know about the second coming of Christ. It's great to have our eschatology all figured out. It's great to know that. But when Jesus Christ comes back, I can't imagine him asking us quizzes on, did we have all of our end time prophecy things all figured out? Did we have all the questions answered? I think basically he's going to find out how many people did you bring with you? How many people did you try to lead to Christ? How many times did you share your testimony and bring others to faith? I think that's going to be the thing. We, we see that in parables. We see that in the teaching of our Lord, that our call is to take that message. And so Paul is sharing a word here to these Thessalonian people. Hey, you guys up there on the mountainside waiting for Jesus to come back, you need to come on back down, plug back into society, get involved in the work, and think about it, here we are almost 2,000 years after the fact, and Jesus has not come back yet. So our call is to be faithful. Live the Christian life, lead people to Christ, disciple them in such a way that they can receive and that they can teach others how to give their lives to Christ. Well, God bless you all. Have a great rest of your day. For tomorrow... I want to encourage you to read the book of Galatians. And tomorrow we will look through the six chapters of the book of Galatians and we'll continue on in our tour through the book of Acts. God bless you all. Let me pray with us before we go. Father, as we come to you right now, I just thank you for the morning. And I pray, Father, each of us this morning will make a fresh commitment to recommit ourselves to keep focused on the real responsibility we have to sharing Christ with others, reaching people, sharing with people the message of the truth. And I pray we'll live this day for you, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you all. You all have a great day, and I look forward to seeing you in the morning, 1017, as we talk about the book of Galatians. You take care.